coming by and listening to me talk about lip gloss. Um, I hope you take away some points today. Um, my name is Becky Vandenbrook. I'm the founder of Girlpalooza, which is a cruelty-free beauty brand for girls. And I started the line this past year because I couldn't really find a beauty product that I felt that I could give my daughter. Um, she's five, she's kind of wanting to dabble into makeup already. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of brands out there that aren't really promoting a super positive message for young girls. And then in addition to that, um, being clean, a non-toxic, cruelty-free. So I developed my own lip gloss formula with a chemist out in California um, last year. And we sat down and I basically looked at the ingredients I didn't want, um, told them, you know, you can absolutely not put any of this stuff in the product. I want a real clean formula. Um, and it also has to be cruelty free as well. So we did that and we launched and now we're just trying to spread the word about our, our product. Um, so is your lip gloss killing you? I was really intrigued by cosmetics when I started looking at developing my brand and finding out that on average women, depending on how much lipstick and lip gloss they wear, but they do swallow at least nine pounds of lipstick lip gloss within their lifetime. And so that got me thinking, well, if you're swallowing that, you're putting it on your lips, you're drinking, kind of everything will slowly over time get ingested. Obviously there has to be some harmful, you know, things that could happen with that. Um, so started looking into ingredients and more or less finding out that the U.S. doesn't really have a lot of strict regulations when it comes to cosmetic ingredients. Um, and so we're going to talk about that in addition to we'll get to some cruelty-free topics and um, selling in China, all that good stuff. So the FDA right now, when it comes to cosmetics, they have two important laws. The first law is the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And basically that just deals with making sure that the um, labeling is truthful and the cosmetic manufacturers are essentially responsible for ensuring that their products comply with the law before they are sent to market. Um, and then the other law that they deal with is the fair packaging and label. So uh, cosmetic vendors are supposed to label their products with all the ingredients, but they can get around that if they say that some of their ingredients are trade secrets, then they don't necessarily have to divulge all the ingredients that are in their, their package, their products. Um, so that is one way to get around that by not having to label all the ingredients. But those are mainly the two issues when it comes to cosmetics that the FDA gets involved with. Um, they do not get involved with any type of testing for safety before cosmetic ingredients go to market. Um, the only thing that they deal with are color additives, so uh, they have no authority to require cosmetic companies to even test to see if their products are safe, which I felt was kind of scary. Um, so the FDA, they can take action against cosmetics, you know, if some people are starting to get harmed by them. Um, but essentially, they really just leave it up to the cosmetic companies to test the products for safety, and they really don't get involved with um, any of the pre-market testing. Um, so Europe has been doing it right for quite a while now. Europe has banned over 1,300 um, chemicals, and so they have very clean formulas if you're buying products that are made in Europe. Um, in comparison, the FDA on their website has only banned nine chemicals. Um, so Europe requires pre-market safety assessments of cosmetics and mandatory registration of cosmetic products. So they're very much more strict when it comes to their cosmetic ingredients compared to the US. Um, these are the nine ingredients right now that are restricted um, by the FDA. And so I just, we're really lacking on cosmetic safety and ingredients when it comes to our products here in the US. Um, so there are, I know a lot of you are into food, so there, you know, there's a dirty dozen of foods. There's also a dirty dozen of cosmetics, which I had no idea until I started researching this. And I'm not gonna go through all of them, but there is a really good website, and I have it listed on the next slide, and it's by a gentleman, David Suzuki, and he is out of Canada. And he has a great website about the dirty dozen of cosmetics, basically explaining 
what you eat, what each ingredient is and where you can find it. Um, so like BHA, that's found in a lot of lipsticks and moisturizers, and that's been linked, long-term exposure has been linked to liver, thyroid, and kidney problems. Um, parabens is a big buzzword right now, so you'll be seeing people um, manufacturing and, and coming out with advertisements about paraben-free. What are parabens? So we'll talk about parabens in a little bit, but um, parabens are a big one right now in the cosmetic industry. Um, so that's his website. I know it's kind of hard to read, but it's David Suzuki. And if you even Google just the Dirty Dozen of Cosmetics, his website will come up, and it's very informative about the, the 12 things that you should really avoid when you're, when you're buying cosmetics. Um, so he's kind of a rock star. I like him a lot. Um, so we're going to talk about parabens. So paraben-free is a big, big thing right now with cosmetics. What, what are parabens? So parabens are chemicals and they are essentially used in cosmetics as preservatives because when you're selling something on the shelf, you don't want it to spoil. You do have to have something in there so it's not gonna mold, it's, it's gonna have somewhat of a shelf life. So parabens have historically been used as a preservative. The problem with parabens is that they mimic estrogen, and so being that they can mimic estrogen, they have had issues with parabens being found in breast tumors linked to some types of breast cancer. So there are some different things with that study. You know, there's really not a lot of things known about parabens, unfortunately. Um, there are continued uh, studies, you know, looking at parabens to try to see, you know, exactly what they do. But unfortunately, parabens are found in a lot of our personal products in cosmetics and everybody is exposed to them. Um, there was a recent study that tested 183 adults and children in California, and they found that parabens were in 70 to 100% of their urine samples, um, depending on the specific paraben that they were looking for. Um, adults obviously tend to have more parabens because we use more products than kids. Um, and then women tended to have higher levels than men because they obviously use more personal care products um, than the men. So again, there's continued studies about you know how harmful are they, what exactly are they doing, and like I said, they had two studies that found parabens were in human breast tumors, but with those studies, they were questioning the validity of it because they were also thinking that maybe the samples could have been contaminated with parabens as they were being prepared for analysis. So I feel like there's a lot more studies that need to be done with regards to parabens, but I think it's something that if you guys can start looking at your products and reading your labels and you know trying to buy paraben free is obviously gonna be better than buying products that have the parabens in them. Um, so there's one good thing that's come along since all this, this past March. Um, there was a couple senators, one out of California, one out of Maine, they introduced new legislation called the Personal Care Product Safety Act, and it's a bill that would require our FDA every year to evaluate at least five ingredients that are found in the personal care product space and decide if they're safe to use, and if they're not, then the cosmetic companies would have to put on their labeling that there are some warnings associated with that ingredient. Um, so hopefully that will get passed. But the, the first set of chemicals to review are these listed up here, and obviously parabens are one of them that is on there. Um, so I'm hoping that this legislation does get passed because I feel like it's a gateway to helping the U.S. and companies here and consumers um, being able to buy safe cosmetics and having a little bit more restrictions on the ingredients. There's a Think Dirty app. So this is a good one to use if you're at the store out and about. If you want to know if a product is safe and clean, you can just go on your phone and download this app, and this will help you decide if what you're buying is a clean product or if they have any of those chemicals that we talked about in there. Um, so cruelty-free cosmetics. This is a big buzzword as well. Everybody seems to be going cruelty-free, which I think is great. Um, most of you probably already know about buying cruelty-free, and when you do that, that basically means that the product's not tested on animals. Um, but I'll just delve into a little bit. You know, there's still cruelty-free going on, and I want to talk a little bit about a case that actually was kind of right in our backyard um, here in Michigan. So this past March, 
the um, U.S. Humane Society released a video of 36 beagles that were being force fed chemicals as part of a, a Dow study being done down Charles River Labs, which is just south of Grand Rapids. So I was kind of floored that it was right in our backyard and that this was going on. Basically what they were doing is they were force feeding these chemicals to the beagles. The study was supposed to last until July and then the beagles would be euthanized. Well, once the video got out, there was a huge public outcry and a petition was uh, form. There were over 100,000 signatures demanding that the beagles be released and not euthanized. And so once this video leaked, I mean, I saw it over here, it was all over the news and people were just outraged. So Dow um, crumbled under public pressure and stopped the study in March of 2019. And then um, after more public pressure, they decided to release the beagles to the Michigan Humane Society for adoption instead of euthanizing them after their animal testing there. And then um, just after Michigan Humane Society announced that they were gonna have the beagles and put them up for adoption, they had over 400 applicants within the first hour to adopt these little guys. So um, 32, <laughs> 32 of the 36 beetles were released. I reached out to the Michigan Humane Society and did some research and nobody is really coming out and finding out what happened to these other four beetles. Um, but 32 of the 36 have been released. And this is one of the little guys that got adopted out and is doing well. Um, and so I just wanted to bring it to everybody's attention that, you know, it's happening right in our backyard. I mean, they weren't testing on cosmetics, but they were testing on, um, I believe it was some type of a fertilizer product. And so just even buying household goods that are cruelty-free, I mean, really, every, anything that you buy, just try to buy cruelty-free just to avoid this kind of a thing. Um, and then I wondered, like, well, why are beagles being used? So. Beagles are used because they're so gentle in nature and calm and trusting, and they just, they're great. Um, so I came across this organization, they're out of California, the Beagle Freedom Project, and what they do is they actually try to go around, go around to these labs and get undercover video and try to uh, basically release the beagles and stop the animal testing on the beagles, and then they work on rehoming them. So they're a nonprofit out of California, uh, they have a great website as well. I would encourage you guys to reach out to them and if you feel like you want to donate, that would be great. But they have a lot of different um, rescue stories on their websites about all over the country where they've gone in and rescued beagles. And it's a very secretive, I mean, they actually have to go in with cameras and, and go undercover to try to get the video because it's a very secretive um, society when it comes to animal testing on, on these dogs. Um, so cruelty free in selling in China, you know, there's companies in the U.S. that will claim that they're cruelty free, but it, if they go overseas and they sell in China, China mandates animal testing on anything that's imported into China. So companies like Mac, unfortunately, can say that they're cruelty free, but if they're selling in China and importing into China, then um, they have to have animal testing on their products. Now, China changed some of their laws in 2014, which basically stated that if you have a cosmetic company or any type of company inside China and you're manufacturing product inside China, you don't have to do animal testing, but yet it's still not banned. So it's not required, but it's not banned either. But again, if you're sending products overseas into China, anything that's going into China has to be animal tested. So it really just depends on how far you guys wanna go down the rabbit hole with these brands and companies that you are supporting and buying. Um, because like I said, if they sell in China, um, they're not totally cruelty free. Um, so China, mainland China, those are the laws with mainland China. Hong Kong is a little bit different, so if you import into Hong Kong, they do not require animal testing. So it can get a little confusing, um, but for those of you that just wanna be super diehard about supporting companies that are cruelty free, I would just encourage you to see if they sell in China, um, and if they do, then they're not 100% cruelty free, unfortunately. China is a big business right now. I mean, their, their cosmetic industry is going up to 26 billion and it's, it's skyrocketing. So a lot of these big brands want to sell over there because it's all about money, unfortunately. Um, 
So we'll talk about vegan and cruelty free because I know that sometimes it's confusing if you think that you're buying a product that's cruelty free, um, don't automatically think that it's vegan because it, it, it necessarily cannot be vegan but still be cruelty free. So again, cruelty free is just buying products that haven't been tested on animals. Um, but vegan, buying a product that's 100% 100% vegan just means that there's no animal ingredients in the formula. Um, so cruelty free and vegan, there's definitely a distinction between those two. So if it's important for you to buy vegan products, I would encourage you to again, read your labels. Um, and so some of the things that make products not vegan, um, Carmine, you know, that's just a red dye that's collected from a certain type of crushed beetle. Um, they're saying that typically 150,000 insects need to be crushed in order to get one kilogram of dye. Um, beeswax is a big thing that's used um, in a lot of cosmetics to be an emulsifier or a film forming agent. Um, lanol lanolin, wool wax, um, that's found in a lot of hair and skin conditioners. Um, collagen, um, squalene. So those are just some of the products. I mean, there's definitely more. Uh, but those are some of the common ones that you'll find in cosmetics and different personal care products that will definitely, they won't be, be vegan if they have those in them. Um, I feel like more companies are trying to go cruelty free, which is great. But again, if it's important for you to buy something that's vegan, then that's something that you're going to want to do is read your labels. Um, and then as far as, you know, trying to see if something is cruelty free. So we have these really cool logos now. Um, Leaping Bunny, um, PETA has a certified cruelty-free logo, and then there's the Choose Cruelty-Free logo, which they're out of Australia. Um, so a lot of these companies will start putting these logos on their packaging, so they're just trying to make it easier for customers to see that this is a cruelty-free product, um, we're not testing on animals. And then, actually, PETA has this one as well, so they do a certified cruelty-free and vegan logo. Um, which is helpful if you're wanting to make sure that the product is vegan as well. And then these are two really good um, sites, Ethical Elephant and Cruelty Free Kitty. Um, they're a couple of bloggers and they are really well versed in buying cruelty free, um, vegan. They will list products that are cruelty free and vegan on their websites and they do a lot of just really informative um, different articles every month. So I usually follow those guys quite a bit. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess the takeaway from this message today is just hopefully you can get better at reading labels, looking at your ingredients, making sure that you're buying safe, not only cosmetics, but just even household goods, cleaners, things that you use every day around your house, um, trying to buy cruelty free, and then you know, taking it a step further if you even want to just look into buying vegan products as well. Um, so clean, cruelty-free, and vegan products are where we're going towards. Um, so yeah, that, that concludes my talk, and I hope that you guys still want to wear lip gloss and, and cosmetics after this. But um, Are there any questions? <clears throat> Talk a little bit more about girl. Oh, Girl Palooza. Yeah. So yeah, that all started about a year ago. My daughter was watching me put some makeup on in the morning and she wanted to try on some of my lip gloss. And at that time I had been pretty hyper vigilant about what I'm feeding her, what I'm using on her hair, her skin, all that stuff. And I mean, I don't usually let my five-year-old wear makeup, but I was like, okay, if she wants to play around, I'm fine with that. But I, I started thinking, you know, is this even safe for her to use? I mean, I really didn't care about myself, but um, so I, that's kind of how it started. So I started researching cosmetics and I was just appalled to find out that there is very little regulation and um, really laws regarding to the ingredients and what you could put into a product. Um, and that's, that's where it started. So I, I went out and I started looking at different places like Alta and Sephora and I was thinking, okay, well, is there a brand out there that I would want to buy for my younger daughter, even when she gets a little bit older, that's, you know, prom promoting, you know, a powerful girl power message, but yeah, it's clean. I wanted it to be cruelty free. I felt like it should be important that it be vegan because I kind of feel like, well, if you're going to be cruelty free, it should be vegan. I feel like those things should be tied together, but unfortunately they're not. So 
I was like, I'm gonna make something. I'm gonna make a lip gloss. I'm gonna go out and figure out how to do this. Um, so I started Googling how to make lip gloss. And I realized, well, at the time, I have a full-time job, and I'm like, well, I can't. I can't do this. I need somebody to help me. Um, so I entered the Start Garden 100 Ideas contest um, the first year that they had it. Um, pitched a cruelty-free brand for young girls was selected as one of the top 100. They gave me $1,000. I bought a plane ticket, flew out to California, met with three labs and their chemists, told them this is what I wanna do, these are the ingredients I wanna use, um, these are the ingredients that I don't wanna use, um, and the rest is history. They developed the, the gloss and I ship it out of my house in Ada, and yeah, that's how it started. So, and we're looking at expanding into some bath and body products and then hopefully eventually some kind of a teen skincare line. So we're gonna pitch Start Garden next year to launch a, a skincare line. And they're a great organization for any type of startup if anybody wants some resources. And your products are down in your booth. Products are down in the booth, yep. And then we sell online as well. Um, and on Amazon, so free shipping, everything's online. Question here and then we'll go here. Yes. In the front? You know, oh, mine was what she said. About yes. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like teen skincare is kind of a big thing. A lot of the teens, they don't wear a ton of makeup, but I feel like they're really wanting to know about skincare and, um, you know, especially if they get in that puberty age where they're starting to break out, I think skincare is really important to them. So our goal is to do a full skincare line at some point aimed more towards teens and Really, our demographic is you know younger girls, tweens, teens. Um, some of the lip glosses I initially developed were ones that I wanted to wear, so I feel like if moms want to wear them and share with my daughters, that's fine too. But we'll we'll also be launching a um, more like a glitter gloss that's a real young target market later this this year as well. Yes, lady in the red. You know, I don't delve into that that area. You know, the FDA, they get a little bit more involved when it comes to sunscreen, because um, I had even thought about doing some type of a lip balm with sunscreen. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't get involved with the sunscreens. I know, you know, you can go on the FDA website and there's a wealth of knowledge with the sunscreens. I know that some of the, um, vendors I was at in Madison for the Iron Man and there they have an awesome farmers market and I was talking to one vendor who made all of her own lip balm and I'd asked her about sunscreen and she used coconut oil as a natural form of sunscreen so um, I just feel like when you delve into trying to put a lot of that stuff in your products um, I would rather just try to limit its use but obviously I think there's a need for it when you're out in the sun Wendy, you had a question. So if we wanted to meet your daughter, how could we do that? Today? Oh, Lola's here. She's under the booth watching YouTube videos. <laughs> yeah, she's passing out stickers, and yeah, she's here today. So she's down at the booth and trying to hustle. <laughs> Questions so in the back. Yeah. yeah, cool. Yeah, what's your question? Uh, are you still working your other job? I'm not. I left. I left. I was an internal medicine PA for 15 years. And I worked um, mainly in the hospital as a hospitalist, did some critical care work, and then did some outpatient internal medicine. And so my background, actually, I had to do a lot of chemistry when I was in school. And I was, I, I mean, I liked organic chemistry, but I didn't really care for chemistry that much. But it was just very ironic that when I flew to the lab, the chemists are the ones that make the cosmetics. So it was just irony at its finest. But no, I left to focus on this full time, which I feel like, I mean, as an entrepreneur, I mean, it's it's a big risk. Um, I mean, it was hard to leave a really well-paying job, but I feel like the medical field, and that's a whole nother topic, is it's a lot different now than what it was 15 years ago when I was practicing, so. But I feel like it gives me a good background to understand a lot of the ingredients and the terminology and how things are made with, with having that background. Any other questions? Are these your little uh, uh, show and tell? Yeah, them? I brought up a couple of them. We're actually doing some rebranding, um, but that's what it is right now. We have some t-shirts, hats, and then we're, there's five colors of lip gloss, and again, they're all PETA certified, cruelty-free, vegan, um, 
clean. My formula is based on the European standards for ingredients, so I really followed their guidelines when formulating and developing the cosmetics that I'm selling. What about chapstick? You know, chapsticks don't, to be honest, have that great of a margin. <laughs> So, you know, especially because we don't, we're not a brick and mortar, so it'd be easy to sell chapstick if I had a brick and mortar, but doing um, everything on e-commerce, um, I don't think somebody would buy like a $3 chapstick and then I have to pay for shipping, unless I did like a bundle. But there's a lot of really good options for chapstick out there, so I feel like it's really easily accessible to the public, especially with the natural bombs. I mean, there's people selling them here. Um, but when you get into formulating cosmetics, it gets a little bit trickier. Yes, another question. You mentioned that the medical field has changed tremendously in the last 15 years. Would you want to comment on that further? Um, I think that, and maybe it was just that I was a little naive to begin with. I mean, it's it's a business. Um, I felt like it wasn't really about taking care of people. I feel like it was about profit. and. I got sick of fighting with insurance companies about medications that they didn't want to cover and pre-authorize, you know, no, I mean, it was just, it got to be, I mean, insane. I mean, then, you know, they want us to do everything on the computer, and so I felt like I was on my computer more than I was actually seeing patients and talking to patients and families, and so it was just, there's a lot that's changed. It's unfortunate, but um, hopefully it'll swing back the other way. The other way. I, I just feel like when the government gets involved with trying to tell you how to practice and insurance companies, it just it gets messy. So I just kind of got fed up and I was like, I'm out. How do we find out more information about Girl Palooza? So I have a website, it's www.girlpalooza.com. I was able to get the .com and most of our information is there and then we're on social as well our um, instagram handle is at my girl palooza and the same with facebook is at my girl palooza sound of applause for becky nice job to you. thank you very much uh, come on up and uh, any personal questions to becky she's here and we will start back up at one o'clock with our next topic let's get zero wasted